man, this is a really weird Castlevania game. With the massive success of Akuma Joe Dracula, known in the West as Castlevania, it should be no surprise that Konami would go on to get as much mileage out of that franchise as possible. A number of sequels, remakes, and spin-offs were inevitable, and still continue to this day. However, one port, and I use the term loosely, seems to have escaped from the mainstream fandom associated with Castlevania. Released for the MSX2 computer in Japan and Europe, Vampire Killer is an interesting take on Castlevania's gameplay and may very well be the first Metroidvania. Before we dive in, if you enjoy this video please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Likes, subscribers, and comments are all critical to satisfying the YouTube algorithm and helping me to reach a wider audience, which means I'll be able to make bigger and better videos. Thank you. I am the Bitkeeper. Vampire killers are very sinister, heart pounding, pulse quickening adventure through the dark depths of the demonic halls of the castle of Dracula. Yes. There's no escape. There's no rest for the weary. No. There is only death ahead. Death and misfortune. I'm really sorry about that. That guy was here once before. He did a Halloween special, which I did not sign off on. Uh, I sealed him back up in his crypt. I don't think he'll be coming out again. I put like a lot of heavy stuff on there. Um, so yeah, I mean, the only way to get that guy to come out of that crypt is if a lot of people really want it. So if you leave a comment saying you want more of that guy, then I'll get him and I'll let him out. But if you're not telling me you want him, the magic doesn't work and he stays sealed in this script. So let me know in the comments whether you want him or don't want him. If you want him, I'll get him. But you don't want him. Unlike the Castlevania on the NES that we all know and love, Vampire Killer doesn't have a straightforward progression from one stage to another. Instead, the castle is a series of relatively large open maps. It's easy to get lost in them and wander around, often looking for a key to the next map. You can even exit one side of the stage and come out the other, kind of like Pac-Man. As a matter of fact, I would not recommend playing this at all without a map, like, on your phone or on your second computer screen, because you're gonna have no idea where to go. The platforming does get pretty intense, and you're gonna find yourself backtracking a lot, like, you'll jump over to grab an item, but you can't get it, you have to jump down and then get the key and then go back and then come back again and then jump over and now you can open the chest. That, that sort of situation. The game does have a map, but it was released before mini-maps really were a thing. So there's no on-screen mini-map, but once you pick up a map item in any given level, you can press the F2 key to view that map. Uh, but that map really isn't very good. There are a total of 18 stages across 6 levels, and each one is filled with enemies, treasures, and merchants. Merchants will sell you tools in exchange for hearts, kind of like Simon's Quest, but you have to whip them a few times in order to get them to sell you something, and if you whip them too many times, they disappear forever and you never get that item. The prices seem to be kind of random, but my understanding is they are affected by what kind and how many Bibles you picked up. I think there's a black and a white Bible, and I think one increases the price and one decreases the price, but I'm not really totally sure about that. 
Simon must collect keys to open treasure chests and lock doors in order to progress through the castle and eventually face Dracula. The stages roughly match up to the NES counterparts, but there are some pretty big differences, mainly in the non-linearity. Simon can also use many different types of magical items during his journey, which can do everything from recover health to make Simon move faster or jump higher. This does come at a cost, however, as Simon's arsenal of sub-weapons is now extremely limited. There is the dagger, which can be thrown straight forward, the classic cross boomerang, and an axe. But this axe does not fly in an arc like we are all used to. Instead, it works just like the cross. You can also carry a shield, which protects you from enemy projectiles. Curiously, each of the aforementioned weapons replaces the whip when Simon picks them up. You can still get the holy water and an hourglass which freezes time, but they act like additional items and not like sub-weapons. They even have their own special button inputs. The hourglass and holy water consume hearts and stay in your inventory. The dagger, axe, and cross, from what I could tell, only last until you move to the next screen, which makes them pretty useless. Unlike the NES game, you won't be able to get the Morning Star right away, and will be using a chain whip or alternate weapon most of the time. After defeating a boss, you're stuck with the normal whip and no items again, including the map. Bummer. You only get three lives, and there are no saves or continues, but once you learn the location of the big key in each level, you can usually get to the next level very quickly, even if that means missing a few items along the way. But that doesn't really matter, because every time you start a new level, you start with no item anyhow. So I think the design choice here was to make a game where once the player knew where a key was, they could quickly move on to the next level, so while you're repeating your progress, it doesn't feel like you're always repeating your progress. While this does feel like a much more robust game with more engaging gameplay mechanics, the design is really poor, and the map gives the player very few clues as to where to go next. Even the user's manual doesn't offer a whole lot of information on where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do when you get there. It's also really, really hard. While making this video, I really wanted to do the entire game so I could show you everything, but I couldn't get past level 4 and I kinda gave up after a little while. Levels 1 through 3 I know where the key is, I can get it and just move on, it takes like 3 or 4 minutes, but once I got to level 4, even knowing where the key is, to actually get to the key, there were just so many points where I had to take damage that I couldn't get to the key without dying. The MSX2 graphics processor was a Yamaha V9938, which was built specifically for this computer. It could be found with 64, 128, or 192 kilobytes of video RAM, depending on the model purchased. And it could display resolutions of 512 pixels by 212 pixels, or 256 pixels by 212 pixels. The trade-off between the two resolutions came at the cost of color. The 512 by 212 resolution can only display 16 colors, whereas the 256 by 212 resolution could do 256 colors. Like most consoles or computers that have these options, the larger resolution was usually reserved for still images or cutscenes. It could also display up to 32 sprites with 8 colors per horizontal line, and could support vertical scrolling. The graphics are similar in style to the NES game, but they look a bit smoother, and they have a different color palette. The assets are roughly the same, just a little upscaled. There's also virtually no flicker on the MSX, which is a really great touch. If you played the uh, Nintendo version of this game, I'm sure you're very familiar with the massive amounts of flicker that occur in that game. Bear in mind that for its time, the Famicom did have rather poor graphics compared to other consoles and home computers that were on the market. That's a whole other story, though. The music and sounds are almost directly ported from the NES version, but it does sound noticeably different here. This is mostly because the MSX2 used a Yamaha YM2149 audio chip, which is a programmable sound generator, similar to what we had on the NES, but is a little bit more limited and only has three voices. It's a copy of the General, in General Instruments AY38910 chip that could be found in many arcade cabinets at the time, and was also used in Intellivision, Vectrex, and ZX Spectrum machines. 
I probably won't be getting this even this deep into the technical details in the future. It's just something I find is not a very popular feature, so I'm going to definitely do a much smaller version of that. But let me know if you want me to get deep into the technical details in future videos, and I'll consider bringing it back. Due to the limited release and the overall scarcity of this game, I was unable to find much useful history or trivia online. If you have any information about Vampire Killer that you would like to share, please let me know all about it in the comments, I would absolutely love to hear it. Vampire Killer is a very interesting footnote in video game history and worth checking out if you want. Uh, it's a Castlevania port that we missed in the US and it's worthwhile just for the novelty and maybe a different take on that franchise. But the game's unforgiving difficulty really makes it more trouble than it's worth. When I was playing this, I found myself thinking I would much rather be playing the Nintendo game. In any case, thank you for watching this video, and please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you would like to see the BitKeeper again, that weirdo that was here before, let me know, I'll bring him back. If you want me to keep him locked in the vault, let me know, and I'll keep him locked in the vault. It's all up to you guys. But definitely leave a comment to help this video and my channel grow. Be sure to tune in next Monday night and we're going to take a look at Haunted Castle, the Castlevania arcade game. That's a shit show. Until next time, game over. <laughs>